In a previous lesson, we learned that two events can be dependent or independent. In this lesson, we will practice determining whether two events are dependent or independent. To do this, we will ask the question, does the occurrence of one event affect the probability of the other event? If the answer to this question is yes, then the two events are dependent. If the answer to this question is no, then the two events are independent. Now, in a previous lesson, we looked at these two questions that both involve selecting two balls from a box. In the first question, we are selecting the two balls without replacement, and in the second question, we are selecting two balls with replacement. For both questions, we defined event A as selecting a green ball on the first draw, and we defined event B as selecting a green ball on the second draw. Now for the question where there was no replacement, we found that events A and B are dependent. For the question where there was replacement, we found that events A and B are independent. In general, you will find that if we are making selections without replacement, then the two events involving different selections will be dependent. Conversely, if we are making selections with replacement, the two events will be independent. Let's examine two more questions. In this question, we are tossing a coin two times, and we want to find the probability that both tosses will turn up heads. If we define event A as getting heads on the first toss, and we define event B as getting heads on the second toss, then we want to find the probability that events A and B both occur. At this point, we need to determine whether the two events are dependent or independent. So we'll ask the question, does the occurrence of one event affect the probability of the other event? In other words, if we get a heads on the first toss, will this affect the probability of getting a heads on the second toss? The answer to this is no. The outcome of the first toss has no effect on the outcome of the second toss, so we can say that the two events are independent. And if the two events are independent, we can apply the following formula. Now let's examine a different question. Here we are selecting two people from a group, and we want to find the probability that both selected people will be women. If we define event A as selecting a woman on the first selection, and we define event B as selecting a woman on the second selection, then we want to find the probability that events A and B both occur. To determine whether these two events are dependent or independent, we'll ask the question, does the occurrence of one event affect the probability of the other event? In other words, if a woman is selected on the first selection, will this affect the probability of selecting a woman on the second selection? The answer here is yes. For example, consider these four W's and three M's as representing four women and three men. If a woman is selected on the first selection, then for our second selection, we see that three of the six remaining people are women. If a man is selected on the first selection, then for our second selection, we see that four of the remaining six people are women. So the answer to our question is yes. The occurrence of one event does affect the probability of the other event. This means that events A and B are dependent, so we can apply this formula to solve the question. Now in this lesson, we learned that we can test for independence by asking the question, does the occurrence of one event affect the probability of the other event? If the answer is yes, then the two events are dependent. If the answer is no, then the two events are independent. In this video, we're gonna talk about an incredible time-saving shortcut. So first of all, we need a slightly broader view. As a general rule, we've talked about the complement rule already. This complement rule can sometimes be used as a shortcut in some problems. In some of the later videos, we'll talk about this more broadly, using the complement rule as a shortcut. And I'll say right now, ordinarily, the hard thing about using it as a shortcut is recognizing that one could do this. We read the problem and then we have to have the insight, oh wait a second, maybe it would be easier instead of calculating directly what they're asking to calculate the probability that it doesn't happen and then subtract that from one. So once you recognize that, then the complement rule will save you time, but you have to have that recognition. Well here, 
I'm going to show you one case where that recognition will not be a problem. There'll be an automatic clue in 100% of the time you know you can use the complement rule as a shortcut. So that's what makes this such an efficient and powerful shortcut. Here's the big idea. When you see the words at least in a probability question, use the complement rule as a shortcut. Now in particular, whenever the words at least appear on the test, it is almost always part of the phrase at least one. This is a huge advantage for us. Now why would this be? Let's think this through. Suppose there are six trials of something. We're rolling six dice, we're flipping six coins, something like that, and we want to know the probability of at least one success. Think about the number of successes. Suppose I'm flipping six coins. How many heads could I get if I flip six coins? Well, theoretically, I could get anything from zero heads, if it were all tails, up to six heads, all heads. Now, of course, these are not all equally likely, but all of them are possible. So what would be the set at least one? So at least one would be one or more. All of these are at least one. We could say this box here, that's the set at least one. Well, what's the complement of that set? What's the part of the set, the whole set, not included in that box? Well, of course, the complement of that is just zero. And that is always the only case that is not included in the phrase at least one. So this is a huge idea. The complement at least one is none. And therefore we can say the probability of at least one success is the probability of zero successes. So instead of having to figure out a bunch of different probabilities, which is what we'd have to do if we figured out directly, we can just figure out one probability, often a very, very easy probability to figure out, the probability of something happening no times at all, and figure that out and subtract it from one, and we're done. So I'll show you a couple examples of why this is so powerful. Suppose we have this problem. This is a very hard problem. Suppose we roll one fair six-sided die eight times. What is the probability that we will roll at least one six? So let's think about this. We have two choices. We can do sort of the forward, straightforward, the completely straightforward method of solving this. And as you'll find, this will that route will be very, very time consuming or we can use the shortcut. So first, just so you appreciate how much time we will save, I'm gonna show you this, this more lengthy, straightforward method. So just so you get an idea of what's involved with this. So, the standard solution, the condition at least one six includes eight cases. We could get exactly one six or we could get more than one six. So any of the numbers from two through eight, these are also included. These are the number of dice that could show up with a six on it. And again, these are not all equally likely, but it doesn't matter. All of these are possible cases. Each one of these eight cases is a binomial calculation. So that means we'd have to do eight different binomial calculations. So we'd have to do all these calculations. Now, of course, in a problem like this, they're not gonna give it to you in a nice form of all these things added up. You're gonna actually have to go through a lengthy calculation, simplify all this stuff, put it all together as a number, and then choose from the numerical answers. So this calculation could take you, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes. This would be a nightmare calculation. If you want to do it, go ahead. I'm going to show you a shortcut that's much easier. So here's the shortcut, the efficient solution. The complement of at least one six is zero sixes. Well, let's think about this. Probability of not getting a six on one roll is five over six. The probability of that happening, of getting not a 6 eight times, is 5 6 to the 8th. And so the probability is 1 minus 5 6 to the 8th. Now you may have to calculate this, but it may well be that if it's a smaller number, of course, that you will calculate it. But something like this, 5 6 to the 8th, they're probably not going to ask you to calculate that. They're probably just going to write the answer in this form, 1 minus 5 6 to the 8th. So if you did it the forward way, you'd have to realize that you could simplify that whole mess down to something as simple as this. But it turns out the way we did it here, this efficient solution, we got there with almost no calculations. In other words, this was just a ridiculously easy way to get to an answer here. So, in summary, I will say 
Whenever you see the words at least in a probability problem, and especially when you see the words at least one, then you know automatically that the shortest and most efficient solution will be using the complement rule, using the fact that the complement of at least one is zero. Now again, in future videos, we'll talk about using the complement rule in more complicated scenarios and in the other scenarios where it would be a shortcut, there's going to be a problem of recognizing it. For this particular case, there should be no problem recognizing it. You'll see these words and that will be the trigger automatically you know you can use the complement rule as a shortcut.